Okay, well, I am very excited to welcome our next speaker all the way from the UK. Uh, we met at South by Southwest last year on total accident. It was meant to be. Um, happy to invite Pippa Bostock, our di the Director of Development, Engagement, and Marketing at the Mary Rose Trust. This exciting and dynamic role covers a multitude of areas within the organization, including learning, engagement, community development, fundraising, and marketing. Some current projects include the launch of the new 4D cinema experience, Dive, the Mary Rose 4D, which opens this spring. Uh, in her previous role as business director for the Center for Creative and Immersive XR, Pippa utilized her experience and passion for the creative industries to specialize in creative and immersive XR, developing new and rewarding partnerships at all levels. She led the, the creation and development and implementation of the CCIXR at the University of Portsmouth. This seven million pound center opened in May of 2022, exploring 12 areas of immersive technology in innovative and creative ways. She's led many, many projects over the years, and she became a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in 2017 in recognition of her work, and we're excited to hear about all the work she has done and will be doing in her new role. Welcome, Pippa. Thank you, Jeremy. It's fantastic to be here this afternoon. Um, so this all really starts six and a half years ago. I, work, I walked into a new role at the University of Portsmouth in the Faculty of Creative and Cultural Industries. That includes everything from architecture through to fashion, through to computing, games art, creation of games, all these different subjects under one roof. Um, my boss then looked at me and went, OK, you've got six months. Go find the areas of strategic strength and then tell me how you're going to support them. So six months later, I went back and I said, OK, there's this area called XR. And he went, XR? What, what, what's XR? I've never heard of XR. And so I said, OK, look, this is what I think we need to invest in. So over a course of sort of two and a half years, we went through a process of securing £7 million of funding from something called the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership. It's a government-funded body in the UK. They gave us £3.6 million to buy all the kit. The university invested in the rest, which created the spaces. What's different about the centre is that it actually exists to lower the barrier to entry. Now, we all know with this technology, unless you've got a serious chunk of change to invest in this technology, it's not easy to access it. So we open our centre to artists, to creatives, but to all different sectors. We work with the medical sector, we work with the defence sector, across all of those different areas. The centre has 12 different areas. But going back to 2018, 2019, when we were scoping this centre, most of this technology either didn't exist yet or it wasn't publicly available. So I had to go on a journey for 18 months, travelling the world, looking at all these different types of technology, often under NDAs, often under wraps. This piece of technology you can see here with the moon here, that's our white light smart stage that you can see up there. When I first saw that, I wasn't even allowed to tell anyone I'd seen it. But that's virtual production. But what we do with it is use it in different ways, and unexpected ways. You've got one of our motion capture studios there on the left, and the gentleman at the top it works for Industrial Light and Magic. He's a photogrammetry expert, and he built our photogrammetry rig. But this center is so crucial because of the talent shortage. Has anyone in the room tried to hire an Unreal developer recently? There you go. You're going to know that's quite a difficult thing to do. There's not enough of them out there and not enough that can work across all the different sectors. When we started first talking about this centre, a report came out, the Immersive Economy in the UK report 2019. It called these kind of students and these kind of graduates so rare and mythical, it called them unicorns. That became a joke for the next two years. We became known as a unicorn farm across industry <laughs> because we were creating those graduates. And I kind of love it. So there's actually some t-shirts around somewhere that have got CCIXR unicorn farm. <laughs> They're pretty rare, but it made the point to industry that we are here to meet their needs. We have an industry advisory board that's got representatives on it from across all the different sectors, from the Royal Shakespeare Company to the Navy to IBM to DSTL and defence companies. It's about making sure that we're creating the right students and the right graduates for the future, 
but it's also about making sure that industry are working with us to create amazing content. These are just some of the areas. That's our building there. That's Eldon Building at the University of Portsmouth. We are the whole second floor, basically. It's a very large building. Well, not large in comparison to some of your buildings here, but for the UK, it's quite a large building. We've got everything from photogrammetry, motion capture. We literally had to look for all the things we thought were going to be important in the future of XR as we were building it and try to bring it into the center. The idea of the center is you can just come in, you can come to a free workshop, you can understand what is XR, that's our entry level workshop, all the way through to if you're working in the film industry and you specialize in motion capture and you want to learn what's next within motion capture, you can come and do that with us too. So you could be studying as an undergraduate, you could be studying as a master's student, you could be doing a PhD, or you could just be an industry person coming for a training course. I said virtual production, that was taken on our launch night that was May the 4th last year, I endured six months of teasing from industry colleagues about May the 4th, May the 4th be with you. <laughs> oh my goodness, I had it all. When I introduced our keynote speaker that night from Industrial Light and Magic, the penny dropped Why I'd been talking about it. They are part of our advisory board and have been great on our journey. This virtual production technology is so important to us because not only is it the next step, it's moving forward from green screen technology, it's what you can do with it. You can create content on this that is so efficient, so effective, and save such, so much time in your post-production process. You've got three experts in this in the back row. You've got Andy, Michael, and Brian from White Light here. So if you do want to hear more about virtual production and white light and smart stage technology, do talk to those guys as well because some of the projects we've done with this are just scratching the surface. We've only had ours up and running for six months. There's so much more to come. This was one of the first things we did on it. So you, you, that actually looks like a cityscape. Now you assume that cityscape behind you is going to be fixed and it's, it's, it's not going to change as you move the camera. Oh no, that's foliated and it's tracking you. So as you move the camera, you can actually, the cityscape changes behind you. So this is how Olympic broadcasting has been done. This is how so many TV programs, football clubs, everyone else are moving towards creating some of their content. So we've done things for Portsmouth Football Club. There's others exploring that. So it's so much possibility. I look at that and I think, what's a theatre stage going to look like made out of that? Imagine no one's ever going to go to the theatre and the whole audience isn't going to sit there with a VR headset on. We explored it in a partnership with a theatre company, and, but we knew it was never going to be the future. You don't go to the theatre to look at your best friend in a headset. You, want, you go to smile with your friend. You go to look at your five-year-old eating too many sweets. You go to share experiences. This, to me, represents such an easier way of exploring that. Motion capture. Now, the gentleman up there, you may not recognise Ace Rule in that form, but I guarantee you've probably seen one of the movies he's in. So if you've seen The Eternals or a lot of the Marvel movies, he does creature bionics. So this is Ace, it was actually, he does a lot of his motion capture with us in Portsmouth, but he also teaches a lot. He teaches actors how to work in motion capture. You can't just put a motion capture suit on and immediately know how to act in it. You have to learn what's different. You have to learn how your physicality comes across in that space. So we have three different types of motion capture. The key to the center, the key to what works for CCIXR is we are independent, we are agnostic, we will advise any business on what could or may work for them and we will help them on that journey. But we did it in partnership with, in collaboration with our industry partners. Vicon, who do all of our motion capture, were one of those partners. And we have three different ways of doing that. You can do the traditional optical motion capture. We also have the, the two other different types of systems. The whole point is it's about flexibility. It's about systems that can go out into industry, systems that can be used like Move AI without the need for specialist suits. So much possibility. This was um, actually the London Symphony Orchestra. So that's the conductor, Sir Simon Rattle. And that's two of my colleagues, my wonderful technical director, Alex Council, another colleague putting him into that suit. Now the conductor refused to wear the hat. So we had to change, and this is something when you're working in the creative industries, you have to, in any industries, you have to be prepared for the unexpected. He refused to wear the hat, so we couldn't do the full body capture we were planning to do on that day to create it into art. 
So what we did was just focus on his hands and these patterns that were all across the London underground were actually just done from the, from the movement of his arm and interpreted by an artist called Tobias Gramler. That's the main motion capture studio. As you can see, it's a 10 metre performance capture space. That's also a sound capture, that's why it's quilted, so that you can actually capture the audio at the same time. This is a bit like what raw motion capture looks like, if you've never seen it before. It gives you an example of the skeletons, and you can then put, I loved your talk about av avatars earlier on in representation. Once you've got the skeleton, you can put any avatar you like on top of it. So as I've said, the only way you're ever going to catch me doing a, a, a cartwheel is if you put my avatar on someone else's motion capture skeleton. <laughs> it's not going to happen any other way. <laughs> But we've worked with actors, art, we've worked with the National Theatre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, to explore all of these different possibilities. We also have volumetric capture. Now, volumetric capture was when we were building the centre, it was one of the technologies we were most, almost on the fence about for a long time. At this point, it was brand new. If you're not familiar with volumetric capture, anything in that circle of the green space there, you're basically capturing from 40 different video cameras around you. You're then creating a 3D moving image of the performance of the person. It's not instant. Motion capture we can do live in real time and send you around the world that instant with a fraction of a second latency. Volumetrics isn't there yet. You're talking big data files that need to process overnight. We had to build specialist computing rigs, air conditioned rooms, racks, everything to process this data. It's, it's really what I'd call early stage R&D technology still, but the results are incredible. Photogrammetry is, a, I forgot the skeleton was up here, he always sneaks up on me. Um, the photogrammetry rig we have, as I said, it was designed by Industrial Light and Magic's photogrammetry expert. The whole point of this is to, if you're making the new Star Wars film, you want to create the action figure that's going to go on to sell hundreds, you get your actor to stand there like this, press a button, all the, I think it's 182 Canon DSLR cameras fire at that same split second, you've got an instant 3D model of that person. You know, you, you, we've had people come in large groups, you can do 100 people in a couple of hours, and then you've got those avatars. So then you can put them on your motion capture data. What's unique about the centre is having all of this technology under one roof and in one place. If you go elsewhere in the UK, you might find those guys are the expert on virtual production, or those guys are perhaps an expert on motion capture, or they might be an expert in photogrammetry. Nowhere has it all under one roof. That's what makes it so different. You can take your data and try it in different ways. So next to the skeleton up there, you can see myself and my colleague Alex were actually holding two awards there because they were given to us by our business community from our local region for the impact we'd had on them during COVID and through innovation awards. So something that's very important to us is being embedded in our community. We work internationally, but also taking our community with us is really important. It's about building ambition and aspiration in our city and our community. So as COVID first hit in March 2020, Manchester International Festival were working with a Turner Prize winning artist called Tai Shani. Now, she was due to finish her piece that required LIDAR scanning of a head, a person's head, in order to make these 3D models and animate them, bring them to life. Everywhere, all commercial studios shut down. No one had access to scanning technologies. So because we had these scanners and they'd literally arrived the week before, they brought Tai Shani down to the first piece we ever made was for this, the neon hieroglyph. This is an example of the LiDAR scanners being used. And this is a Creaform scanner being used at the Mary Rose Museum. So they're actually scanning a 450-year-old leather bucket that was at the bottom of the ocean for 400 years here. So what we do is we create the photogrammetry 3D models of these, and then we put them online as assets that anyone who's making a Tudor game, Tudor experience, can just use them. They're free models, it's part of our outreach, it's part of our education. So the university scanned an awful lot of our objects. And is, this is actually two of my team, two of my students. You've got Liam and Doug up there. We were lucky enough to have 25 um, students work for me in the last year I was there. Most of them just graduated, they worked with us for a year, and they worked on a whole wide range of projects. 
This is a piece called My Dog Size, is the name of the artist, he's a street artist, and we worked on his exhibition called Inside. Now this is, he's a street artist, so he took over an abandoned casino in the heart of the city and installed his sculptures, installed his artwork across the whole place, and we created the immersive soundscape. So as you get close to some of these, they would talk to you, you would hear things. It was about bringing it to life in different ways. So again, it's just a wide variety of projects. So our music studios and our recording studios are another facility within the centre. All of this is about working in partnership. So Digital Catapult are another government agency, effectively, that are working to enable businesses to get engaged. The Imaginarium Film Studios, again, work on Marvel, Batman, all the, all the big movies you see coming out of the UK. We ran motion capture workshops and VR workshops there with them, getting businesses in. This was before our facilities were built. But the outreach and the engagement with the business community is so important. If you're a small business, your turnover is maybe five, six hundred thousand pounds a year, you cannot afford to invest that fifty, sixty, seventy thousand pounds in a motion capture system until you understand what it can do for you, how it can increase your efficiency, how it can generate revenue. You have to get hands on with these things. You have to test them, try them and understand them. And centres like ours, that's the reason for being, to lower those barriers. So we won, I think it was an £800,000 project um, at the beginning of 2022, which lasted for a year. It was called the Enabling XR Enterprise Project. And it was all about museums, heritage attractions, visitor attractions, understanding what our te XR technology is and how it could work for them and help them. So we worked with six museums from across the UK. The Mary Rose Museum was one of them. But there was also Spinnaker Tower, which is a viewing platform. We had the D-Day Story Museum, all different types of museums looking at different sectors. We had a music festival. And they all had a project created for them. So six XR projects during that. But we also ran networking events. Now, when I applied to the government for this funding, I said, I'm going to get 100 industry professionals through these networking events. And people said to me, that, that's a lot. Are you sure? Maybe you should like, decrease that to like 50 or 60 or something. We had 1,011 people. That shows the demand. People are literally battering down the door to come and understand what this technology is. It's getting that fear factor away. You know, the smart stage technology is fantastic, but on launch night, we realised no one wanted to step on it because they were a little bit scared. And they were, this was a very expensive piece of technology and they were like, what, oh, oh, how do I, do I go on there? So I turned it into a photo booth on launch night. <laughs> the most expensive photo booth ever, probably. But we turned it into a photo booth because it's about, as my colleague was saying earlier, it's about the cognitive load. People understood what a photo booth was. They would quite happily stand there, take their selfie, and we did it so it immediately printed out a picture they could take away with them. It's marketing, it's branding for us, because the photo went away with XR, TCI XR stamped on it. But also, they understood it. And from that point onwards, they could see the point of the technology because they knew it could take you somewhere without physically having to go there. So the, the team there at the bottom right were the ones that actually worked on the Mary Rose exhibit. And the key to this project was actually working most of the assets were created in our Unreal Engine, because that's our engine of choice, really. But we made sure that any assets we created, we could use in multiple ways. So our digital assets work on the smart stage. You can fly through the seabed, through the smart stage, and present on it. As Dr. Alexander Hildred, lady in the green jumper there, she was one of the original divers on the Mary Rose 40-something years ago. And she brought the ship up with an incredible team. So, she can now lecture and present and teach about bringing this ship up using this technology. These are some of the other experiences that were made for the Mary Rose. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the Mary Rose was King Henry VIII's flagship. It sank in 1545, about a mile off the coast of Portsmouth in the UK. And there it stayed on the seabed for 450 odd years before being found again in the 1960s by Alexander McGee, and he worked with a land archaeologist called Margaret Rule, and together with an incredible team, Royal Engineer Divers, and lots of volunteers from across the South Coast. It was one of the most compelling stories of human endeavour. They brought this back up. 
they brought the ship back up to the surface and it's now in an incredible museum in the UK where I now work. We put King Henry VIII in a VR headset. <laughs> that photo actually was on the Independent and the Times. It, was, it, it caused a bit of a stir at the time. This was on the 40th anniversary of raising the ship. So we went back out to the wreck site where it sank and did our VR experience called Our Silent World above the wreck site. So King Henry VIII there is actually looking at an experience of diving on the seabed, seeing the ship as it was when it was found 40 years ago. That piece has just been entered for Tribeca, which we're waiting to hear for, and we're hoping to take it around the world so people can understand how the ship was found. To me, all of this technology is best used when you're not focusing on the technology. From a user experience, you don't want to know whether it was created in Unreal or Unity. It's, it's irrelevant. This technology is best used when you're just focusing on the magic and you're enjoying the experience and, and to do things that you can't otherwise do. So Aspects Gallery um, are an art gallery based in Portsmouth. They were another participant in the project. They created a volumetrically captured film. So all of this is again rendered in Unreal Engine. We captured performers, actors in volumetric and dropped them into the film. So that was the, the case study they wanted to explore. For Spinnaker Tower, the viewing tower I mentioned, they wanted to show you all the things that have happened in history from this tower over the last 300 years. So we, we brought back through AR the Spitfire, Spitfire planes. Um, we even did a fun version, a bit of an Easter egg where we had Father Christmas's sleigh going past. It was just exploring, showing them what the possibilities were for using tablets and creating this kind of app. Um, it's now been very popular. They've rolled it out. They're continuing with it even after the end of the project. But the thing I'm most proud of when I look at this project that we did for a year was the team we created throughout it. We created 25 graduates who have now gone into industry jobs across the UK and beyond. They're the next generation. We were solving that talent shortage I started off talking about. Hattie, who's up there, she was one of my XR producers. She's now an XR producer for the Natural History Museum in London. Doug is now creating military simulations I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> Or he'll probably hunt me down. Um, they're all off doing amazing projects on industry. The Christmas tree, as you can see behind me, again, that is our smart stage. I jokingly said to the team two days before the presentation on this, can you build me a log cabin? And can I have Christmas trees and a fireplace? They did it. They even put photos of the team in the log cabin as family photos. So it's about the talent. And that's the real legacy of that project for me. So one of the things that CCIXR worked on, one of our first projects after winning our funding, was something called Dream. Now, Dream was working with the Royal Shakespeare Company and 16 partners in total to solve the problem of how do we use this technology within theatre. This goes back to what I was saying about working across different sectors, medical, education, defence, and taking the best learnings from each of those and bringing it to other sectors. And universities are perfectly placed to bring that, to be that conduit to take what's happening at the cutting edge of theatre and saying to the military, oh, have you, have you ever seen this? Can you, what about trying this? Or what about trying that technology? And that's one of the crucial roles we've taken on. So within Dream, we actually did all of the motion capture within it. So these, um, and this interesting story about Dream, it was supposed to be live in Stratford-upon-Avon for thousands of people in June 2020. You might be seeing the problem that happened there. So obviously we had to pivot and we had to pivot quickly. So as a team, we came up with this idea of live performance, motion captured around the world. Now, Dream reached 80,000 people, over 10 live performances in 153 countries. I went live to Sydney Opera House from Portsmouth, two o'clock in the morning. Don't tell anyone, but I was wearing my slippers. <laughs> cameras were only up from here but the point was we could do all of that even during covid because we had only 30 people in the building 30 people to manage a live stream and that included six actors two cameramen so you can see what a small technical team so we were all multi we were all multitasking we were all doing things that in a normal project you'd have brought other people in to do those things we all learned so much from working on this i'm going to give you a, i'm just going to show you the trailer which only plays for 30 seconds but to give you an idea of the project Oh, might have to press the other button. Follow me.
So what's very special about Dream is the wonderful digital director who brought the whole project together for the RSC, Sarah Ellis, uses everybody, as she says, for their superpowers. So we literally brought everyone in to look at their specialities, to how it could be explored. And to give you an example, um, this, was, this was the studio we were actually filming that in. So that's, you might recognise Alex Council from some of the earlier photos. He's the technical director for CCIXR. <laughs> Oh my goodness, you can even see me. I didn't realise that. You can see me sitting there. That's how we went live when we had to do a Q. We did a live performance, which is about half an hour. Then we did a Q&A at the end of every live performance answering questions. And sometimes that was to school children around the world. I think we did school children in America. And then we went, sometimes we were talking to about 25,000 people at a time. We were able to do that all live from Portsmouth and to, to bring the project to life in a, it was a different way to how we anticipated it, but it was all part of a government funded project called Audiences of the Future. Now, it required us to work together to create a new lexicon. Because if you say technical rehearsal to someone from the Royal Shakespeare Company and you say it to my technical team, I can guarantee you that's two different languages and means two entirely different things. One of my favourite moments from the whole project was M, who played Puck in this, was working with her actor colleagues to actually work out how she could, they could appear to be stepping between cobwebs strands, if you like. Cobweb was played by Maggie Bain, an incredible actor, and Maggie controlled the eye by using her hands and her physicality in the space, which was just quite incredible. But watching them puzzle through how they did this movement and how they did it live was one of the standout moments for me. That was an afternoon that I'll never forget. And we had three months to bring this whole thing together from start to scratch. So it was creating that joint lexicon. It was telling those stories and finding new ways to, to solve problems that had never been done before. And this was live in March. Um, 2021, that's when the project took place. But of, a lot of what we do is getting our students working directly with industry, so I'm just going to play you a short game trailer. This was created by our students and won the, uh, an award for Student Game Project of the Year. Oops. do that's quite unique is we actually all of us most of our third years across a wide range of courses they work on a real industry challenge so some and they'll pick there'll be a whole long list of projects companies that I've met or my colleagues have met across the years and they give their challenges in like one from the Royal Navy was they keep damaging this boat every time they try and sort of moor it. Please, can you work out a way that we can train them not to damage the boat? And you'll hear more about that in a second. Sometimes they're, we need to firefight on side a ship, but it's too dangerous to do real simulations. How can we tackle that? It's a wide range of different options and different things. Just to summarise, if I forgot to put that slide up, that's all the people and the collaborators that took part in Dream. So you've got Punch Drunk, who you might have heard, they do Sleep No More um, in New York, I know. You've got Philharmonia Orchestra, you've got Manchester International Festival, Marshmallow Laser Feast, Magic Leap, who we worked with extensively. We had fellowships and, and worked across a whole range of the project. Unreal, Intel, and, and lots more. So it just gives you an idea of, of the number of different collaborators that were involved to make this possible. If you want to find out more about Dream, you can actually go to the website. One of the things we wanted to do is, because this was a government-funded project, it was all about sharing the learning. So if you go to Findings in the Future, you can actually, I think it's findingsfuture.co.uk, you can download all the documents, you can watch all the interviews, you can see clips from the film, and you can understand how we were exploring what the, the future is for live performance and how real-time motion capture was the solution that we went with in this case. 
spoke about the Navy and their ship. So the first sea lord came into the XR lab, as he often did, and went, please stop them scratching this boat. He gen- I won't use the language he did, because this is polite company. But it was very much, stop them damaging my boat. Please teach them how to park this boat. So our students, group of third-year students, um, that's our final year of our degree. So they were final-year students on undergraduate degrees for a year, worked alongside the Navy and with a company called Novatech as well, who are a, a computer company. We created this rib simulation for them. It was so successful that at the end of the project, the Navy went, OK, we'll buy 15. And then they rolled out across the UK. I still see them when I'm traveling, visiting colleagues and things. Um, they're now rolled out across the UK. And if you learn to drive a Pac-24 boat in the Royal Navy, you learn on one of these simulators. They also employed all of the students, that were, apart from one who already had a job elsewhere. But all of the students that worked on that project went on to carry on with the project. Now, that's very common. We are an industry-based university. A lot of our students go on to be employed by companies they've done third-year projects for. We also do a lot of placement years. That's another, another common way of finding employment. But with the Royal Navy, I think we've done 150 projects over 10 years. We, we've done a lot. I mean, we are based in Portsmouth. You trip over the military bases, you leave the city. But you know, it, it's an integral part of us meeting the needs of our community. You can see different versions of it. We originally did a standing one, because that's what you'd be standing as you drive the actual Pac-24 boat. Then they wanted a seated version, so it was different models. These are some of the students um, that actually created it. It's, and we also took it, we do a lot of outreach. So we took it, say you have GDC here, we take it to the UK equivalents. Lots of other places looking. It was a 500k contract from the Royal Navy for the 15 simulators. So it had huge benefits for the industry partner because they went on to win that contract. But it had benefits from the university because our students were actually working with industry, getting real experience they could put on their CVs. So for us, collaborative projects are the real key and at the heart of what we do. There are so many different ways that you can collaborate with, with universities such as CCIXR. And I know we've talked a lot about, um, I did laugh when we were talking about children in VR earlier on. I will confess, that's my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> my kids have been using VR since they were quite small. Um, but I, and we, 13 is an age group, but actually I've seen such inspiration for younger children than that, that I think it just ha- everyone has to make their own judgments sparingly. But my personal opinion, used occasionally, that, that doesn't do any harm. This is actually a kind of an LED saber experience that our students made as a game. So that's what we're doing. So we take it to comic cons and stuff like that, and we just get people to, for a lot of people, it's their first ever taste of VR. But that aspiration and inspiration is such an important thing. We've had so many children try one of our things at outreach and go, oh my gosh, there's a deg- I can do a degree. I can study what I love. And it's making people realize that that's a possibility. And that's why experiences like this are so important to me. I love this project. Now, this dress you can see here. This was a museum called Worthing Museum. The project was called Designing Disgust. Now, the museum came to me and they said, yeah, yeah, it's great. We know how we can display all of our wonderful, beautiful things everyone wants to go and look at. But what about the rings that are made of tarantulas? What about the cape that's made of monkey skin? What about, and they have a duty to conserve all these things because they have them in their archives already. But how do they display them? Because no one wants to see them. So we created a whole um, exhibition. It was a prototype project. It was a short project. A whole exhibition, but challenging your beliefs around disgust. So when you first walked into this room, you saw the dress that you just saw the the whole orange dress to start with. And slowly, all the silkworms dropped out of the dress. And over the course of an hour and a half, I think it was, the whole dress filled up with silkworms until the whole dress is moving. And then the narration, me being annoying, goes, how do you feel about your beautiful dress now? 2,000 silkworms were boiled alive for your dress. And it went on and you, you, you put the monkey cape on and yeah, you could feel the heartbeat and things. And I normally tell this story and I make sure I have a plastic water bottle in my hand. And I go, in 50 years time, will this be viewed with more disgust than the silk dress? It, it was all about challenging perceptions, but it's just an example of how the XR technology can be used in unexpected ways. As I said, this was the Innovation Awards. We did not expect the surprise we got that night. We offered 
to host to support our local innovation awards and we won three awards on the night one was for the Mary Rose project you've seen um, one was for another project and then the final one was for having an impact on our local area for changing our local area by giving businesses the opportunity to engage with this technology they would not have otherwise had so January this year following on from the work I'd done with the Mary Rose Museum I moved to the Mary Rose full-time as a development director in its time the Mary Rose was the most technically technologically advanced flagship that the Royal Na the Navy had ever seen, the British Navy had ever seen. To me, it's only right that we continue that legacy of using cutting edge technology to tell its story. It's human endeavour, the, the work of volunteers to bring this thing from, you know, metres and metres of water in the 1960s, 70s and early 80s. That's just incredible. So our new 4D cinema experience is all built and created in Unreal Engine. It's the first one, to our knowledge, to be created solely using Unreal Engine. Um, I'm going to again play you a small clip. Actually, that's the still. That's actually one of the Unreal Engine stills. You can see there. I think it might be a bit dark on your screen, but it shows the hull of the ship being lifted. Here's a video for you. So as you can see, it's telling that story in a different way. It's engaging new audiences. Um, it's very early days. It literally only opened on the 30th of March, which is why poor Amelia and Jeremy had to be very patient with emails with me over the last few weeks. Um, but it's already created a 43% spike in our visitor numbers in the first three weeks of operation. So there's evidence already that it's, it's doing its job. It's generating the, those younger people wanting to come in and hear the story and engage with it in a different way. Oops. We've also used holographic technologies. So obviously you can't look at the ship and see what it was like when it was sailing on the Solent currently. We've already been using holographic fans, that's a hypervision fan, um, to show opposite the main ship how the ship looked when it was sailing. These are really early experiments, there's lots more we want to do, but it's just to start the story. Um, we are very much open for collaboration. Collaboration is key to all the projects I've done. Not sure what's happened to the um, visual there. But anyway, that was my last slide. That was me just saying thank you very much. My, <laughs> my contact details are out there. So.